Welcome to ECV Ask an Expert. Um, today, I am joined by Carlo Martin, Gary Chesever, and Jeremy Rossman. Uh, Jeremy is a virologist. Gary is a polymath who moonlight, moonlights as an ex-surgeon, among other things. Um, and Carlo, I believe, is in the uh, medical business field, but has experience in, like, touches on so many different things that he's always fascinating and incredibly technical to listen to. So we're joined by um, quite the panel today. And uh, our topic is vaccination, vaccines for COVID. Um, and so... I guess we can get started. Um, I guess I'll share kind of my my principal thought on vaccines to give us a jumping off point, which is they are treated far too much like a a holy grail, and they are far too much like a pipe dream in reality, um, especially given the time scales that people think of them in and that I would love to see a vaccine. I am not really prepared to wait for a vaccine to be available in the way that people expect it to just disappear this disease. But I'm not even sure that that viewpoint is at all correct um, because there's so much noise on the topic. And so I would love for you guys to wait in and give your thoughts. Um, does anyone want to start? Sure, I can jump right in there. Um, start with a really easy question, why don't you? Thanks. It's, uh, so from, from my perspective, there are, you know, first of all, there are two different time frames that we're talking about. I think on, we hear so much conversation about when are we going to have a vaccine? But often that means when are we first going to get a vaccine licensed for use in say the US or any specific country. But when the vaccine is first licensed, that does not necessarily and actually not at all equate to when a vaccine is available to say you or I. And that is going to be two very different things because the, distri the, the licensing, the marketing, the distribution, the vaccination campaigns is going to be hugely complicated. And so I think we're going to have a vaccine license in the not too distant future. Whether or not that's a good vaccine that's both safe and effective, that's a, quite a different question. But I think we will have a licensed vaccine, I would say, by early 2021. But when it's going to be available for the general public, is probably going to be a minimum of six months, if not even longer, because the manufacturing and the distribution, and it's probably first going to go to high risk groups, to healthcare workers and other frontline workers. So it's going to take a long time. So this is not a, you know, we get a vaccine and then all of a sudden all our worries are done. And chances are the virus is still going to be present because we're not going to vaccinate the world. So this is, we can't just wait. We don't need to just wait. That's the important thing that ECV has been saying all along. We don't need to wait. We're not at the mercy of the virus. Our actions matter and we can get to zero regardless of the vaccine, but the vaccine will help. Thanks, yeah, that's an awesome point. Like the, the vaccine is kind of a, more like a last line of defense then like the, and lots of people are treating it as the solution instead of part of a solution set that becomes available over time. Um, and we should be using the tools and solutions that we have available to us today, had available to us yesterday, and not peg all our hopes, all our eggs in one basket. Gary, do you want to jump in with uh, kind of maybe talking about the medical side of vaccines and what vaccine deployment like might look like in terms of um, 
like uh, in person or something. I'm trying to give you something to jump in with. Well, th there's there's two concepts maybe we'll touch on. They were interesting to me as I was preparing. I, I think mostly on this talk, I'll defer to Carlo and to Jeremy and just uh, occasionally if we uh, need a question like, is the neck bone connected to the head bone, I can comment on, on uh, deep technical subjects. Um, there are, uh, however, what's called the sterilization immunity in uh, vaccines and disease mitigating vaccines. And I don't think even when we do get to that all eggs in one basket possible last resort answer, assuming we can get there and hoping we can get there, uh, there's going to be some questions which we won't know, I think probably until well after a vaccine's licensed and well into phase three trials, uh, even potentially which of those two categories we're in. Now to clarify that, some vaccines uh, give the immune system enough of a boost that the person vaccinated uh, is then immune to getting the infection. They, they won't actually get the infection. So that's uh, sometimes termed sterilization immunity. Uh, other vaccines, one of which would be the example of the seasonal flu vaccine, um, in that case, it really confers some resistance to a more severe case, but doesn't really prevent complete infection in every person. And that may turn out to be very important when we think about things like long haul COVID, that we may have a vaccine that prevents us from overrunning our ICUs, but still doesn't protect people from long term disability. Um, that That's one thing that maybe both Jeremy and uh, Carlo would want to expand on. And when you ask about deployment, that's a whole other interesting set of issues. And I'll hit that briefly clinically from a physician office perspective. We'll put, put ourselves in the office mindset here for a moment. This is not a vaccine, nothing to do with vaccine. It does have everything to do with an office. Um, our infrastructure uh, for register in the United States for registering vaccination for delivering vaccines has been primarily geared toward pediatric vaccination. So one of the interesting things about this deployment is it will be a new thing going through new channels uh, because it's going to need a focus on a much broader age range than the pediatric population. I'm, I'm going to silence now. Thank you. No, I think you bring up a great point that, yeah, vaccines are quite preventative, but you also have to buy into them. And, you know, pediatrics are kind of at the mercy of caregivers and providers to follow guidelines versus aging groups to generally have to, you know, opt in or, or be convinced or you just educated that it's a viable option. So hindsight being 2020, I mean, we had a, a tiny vaccine logistics issue with Shingrix for the shingles vaccine, while Zostavox is actually a product's been around, but Shingrix had a better efficacy, we can call it that, but the logistics of keeping an inventory as well as administrating it to patients and providing routes of access to prevent shingles was always at a loss. It was lapsed. It wasn't really manufactured at high enough rate. It wasn't distributed well enough. And when it was distributed, it wasn't really articulated how to get access to those products. And the thing that was really um, uh, quixotic about it was that Zostavox never really had any logistics issues. So because the, the best good vaccine wasn't available, the person just didn't get anything when they could have defected to the one that was available. So, I mean, I'm excited that we're going to produce humoral and cellular responses from vaccinations or just herd immunity from infections, but I get more concerned when we have more than one vaccine that's approved at the same point in time and one that has a clear financial benefit versus one that has a patient outcome. So it's one of those things that we have to think of this industry cohesively as opposed to just one holy grail vaccine that we're waiting for at the same time. Gary? It, I think that's an excellent point. I'll, I'll expand on that briefly. Having been active uh, in doing some uh, population health for seniors at the time uh, Shingrix and Zostavax were rolling out and had to counsel many families through some difficult decision making because one was available, the other was on the horizon and there were certain restrictions early on. You could get the one and then it might limit you from getting the better one that was coming. And uh, so Carlo, if I understand right, we could be looking at some of that difficult decision making sometime uh, in the next few months to a year or two from now. Especially with um, a major pharmaceutical organization that's been 
appropriated through the government two billion dollars to produce 600 million vaccines that means 600 million vaccines are going to be produced maybe not timely but they're going to be manufactured and if it's the best vaccine or the worst vaccine it doesn't matter it's gonna be the one that we're going to get and whatever new ones come on the horizon that might occlude us from being able to have accessibility to the other ones but then you know i'm not trying to be you know super pessimistic but if it's a poor quality vaccine my main concern is that we don't really destroy products. We just sell them to countries that don't really have the highest quality standards. So if it isn't good enough for America, it's going to find a population to be utilized in. And it's going to occlude those individuals from having access to a potentially better vaccine. So it's, it's kind of one of the joys and, and woes of not even good or bad vaccine. Just what do you do when you're trying to plan for multiple entrants of the market since the entire world is focusing on this very really sexy revenue potential generating intellectual property that everyone's going to utilize in the near future. So I, I want to translate a little bit of what uh, Gary said about sterilization vaccines into normal people speak uh, as the non-expert in the room. Um, and so correct me if I get anything wrong. Uh, so I started to think of vaccination and acquired immunity, so through infection, um, as a resistance threshold. So there's a certain amount that your body can fight off before you get infected. And as a baseline, you have a low threshold, but that threshold isn't zero. So like one virus might just die because your body has baseline defenses that can kill it. And then when you have some kind of weak immunity, it takes like 100 viruses compared to like 10 maybe. And then when you have a sterilization vaccination, the threshold is so high that you would never encounter in normal life the amount of virus that's necessary to get you infected. But it could be that if you spent your entire day in and day out in a room surrounded by patients coughing up their lungs, um, you might still be at threat to get infected, especially if you have like a sleepless night and your immune system's down and you know you add on you know some other factors. And so there, it's kind of a sliding range. It's not a binary. I, I, can, kind a... Of, I can kind of bridge into that. And also the questions that I see popping up around efficacy individual response and, and vaccines that are on development. And, you know, we have to treat vaccines, even though it's made for populations, we're administrating it to N of one patient sample sizes. And if we're giving to somebody that was infected to COVID-19 beforehand, or somebody that's naive to infection, or somebody that has long COVID, we don't really have decent cohorts that are recapitulating those to even anticipate what a response is. So it's one of those things that we don't have clear guidelines, so we need to do a better job of matching outcomes whenever we're not even looking for the disease itself to start seeing how these vaccines are being positioned to even be able to anticipate a, a range of responses since we're not really you know documenting COVID infection itself pretty nicely in some of these trials. So I, I think there's no easy clear-cut blanket statement but it's one of the things that we'll have to proactively measure outcomes at a rate that we classically haven't done in the past. And, and there's a fair that a relatively ineffective vaccine for that N of one, if it doesn't afford enough protection, it may actually give a false sense of security and produce behaviors and lack of isolation that actually makes the pandemic worse. I do want to pose a question to my panelists and anyone in the audience is, I mean, I'm not thinking that we're going to have really exciting natural selection, but what happens when you produce a vaccine that does encourage a more violent strain to penetrate the population that doesn't have access to a vaccine and how we're planning to you know to be responsive to that i mean the genomics is showing that we're not super terribly concerned with a very large virulent genomic transformation of the virus but you know vaccines are selective to certain uh, um, viral entities so is there much effort in trying to plan that out with this vaccine response that we're planning for the first or second or third wave of vaccines that you know of I mean, I, I would say no, not really. Um, I, I think it's it's difficult enough to try and get any vaccine to this virus in this short a turnaround time to try and optimize that so that anything that is 
escape that vaccine is going to be less fit or able to be combated in a different direction is, you know, several steps more advanced than we are in this vaccination campaign right now, if that's even possible. Um, I think for right now, they're just extraordinarily focused on saying, look, can we make a vaccine that works, that is effective? That's number one. Safety, I think, is even a distant number two. Escape mutants, that is way down the line. I mean, it's, it's a relevant factor, but I think people have been, so, I mean, the concern here is that viruses mutate, viruses change. And in the population right now, there are a lot of different subtle variants of COVID-19. So what if the vaccine only works against some of those and some of those variants of the virus either mutate or just Aren't, uh, aren't, aren't inhibited by this vaccine. What happens then with those? And I think in a lot of contexts, people have avoided having to think about that because coronaviruses mutate extraordinarily slowly. For a virus, most viruses don't error check their genomic replication. And so they accumulate mutations very quickly, which is why viruses like flu come back in new forms all the time. Coronaviruses actually error check. And so they accumulate mutations at a much slower rate. So I think because of this, people have been less concerned about mutations arising, but it's very possible. We've already seen mutations arise in coronavirus that have affected transmittability. And we're already seeing, at least at low levels, mutations in the coronavirus genome that affect primer binding for diagnostic assays. They're not terribly prevalent, but they do exist. So this is a risk, but I think right now we're just trying to say, can we get one that works with the most cases? I'm, I'm really loving this conversation and I wanna pose a thought that I have just had that uh, bounces off of what you said about the escape mutants is I think this might be an order of magnitude different type of infection than say the last like pandemic that we had, the flu of 1918, because the world population is so much larger. It's, and so the, the spread of this disease is going to go through so many more bodies compared with the um, like previous pandemics that have happened. And it's happening in like such high rate across so many very genetic, like human genetically different um, populations. Like there may be dynamics that we're not really seeing and not really thinking of just because this is like, this is novel to us in the modern world, but it's also novel as a viral pandemic experiment, just given the differences of the context and the size of the human population and the internet connection of the human population compared with the past. If I could, I'll just expand on that digitally for a moment, and then maybe Jeremy could explain the, the stuff I'm going to put up. But uh, uh, so uh, if uh, if this is working, I, I don't know what's being shown on the screen. Hopefully there's sort of a starburst diagram there. Yeah, I can okay. see it. So that's a clade diagram, uh, fairly up to date as of August 4th, uh, a mutational map. Um, and then uh, if you'll bear with me for a minute here, um, I'm going to stop that one for a second. And then I, I think uh, uh, Jeremy had mentioned that there's uh, some uh, mutations that we have seen uh, even in the binding sites. And uh, let me see if I can manage to uh, show that one also. Um, and then I'll, I'll mute again. Uh, should only take a second here. Um, did, did, did that... Uh, so... The green is the ACE2 receptor. Is, is that is it showing some uh, biomolecular diagrams there? It is. So the green is the uh, ACE2 receptor. And uh, the spike protein that's often talked about, uh, I'll let uh, both Carlo and Jeremy expand on the spike protein. It's very relevant to vaccine design. These colored areas, I don't know if my mouse cursor is showing on the screen. These colored areas are mutations in the spike protein that binds with the receptor. 
I'll ask Jeremy as the virologist. Uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not making horrible mistakes there. Is, is that about? No, it? you're all good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take that diagram off, or I'll mute and leave it up if either you, Carlo, or Jeremy would like to comment on it. You can go ahead, Jeremy. I can follow up after that. All right. So, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, one, this is one important point that actually sort of goes back to the, the previous question, which is that certain vi vaccines here are targeting just one protein in the virus and specifically this spike protein, which is the main protein on the surface of the virus, which tends to be one of the best targets for antibodies. So some of these vaccines are just purified proteins. Some of these vaccines are what we call mRNA or even DNA vaccines, and they make your own cells express this protein so you can generate an immune response. And for those types of vaccines, they are more susceptible to mutations within the spike protein because you're only targeting one protein. But other vaccines are, say, an inactivated vaccine. And this could be the entirety of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's just killed and then given to people as a vaccine. And in that case, you're making antibodies and responses to all the different proteins or the majority of the different proteins in the virus and so that makes it, a, in theory, a slightly more resistant response. The one other caveat that I would just like to say is in response, Gio, to the last question, we're so focused on this comparison with the 1918, or as some of us call the 1917 pandemic, not naming any names here, but um, with that, we're so focused on that pandemic comparison. But in reality, we have to remember that we had a relevant and recent pandemic just in 2009. So we don't need to go to a historic pandemic to look for comparisons. We have a really good comparator very recently. Um, so Carla, I'll, I'll leave it to you for the next steps on the spike. Yeah, just to touch on to the, the aspect of endemic disease that, you know, North Americans, primarily United States of America, don't really have as much appreciation for is that tropical medicine diseases, things in tropical environments generally live with endemic disease as a happenstance. And this is kind of, you know, a global framework, but some places are impacted drastically by, by diseases in an endemic state. So it's not like it's their first rodeo, but they are kind of along with the ride of COVID-19. So I think we don't have to reach very far. We can even just reach in the past few years of endemic disease and how people live already and how we're still trying to mitigate the, the penetrance and, and impact on the communities. But for COVID-19, um, before I got into clinical genetics, my background was actually structure-based drug design. So I was kooky for electron paramagnetic resonance and solid state NMR. So where I get really excited about some of the better virology, um, conserved genomic um, spaces, as well as the proteins that are maybe representative variations of unknown significance, or maybe even for the, the genomic single nuclei polymorphisms, that we have more than just vaccines out there. Like there are so many things that we can actually utilize the same data sets to start focusing on other health interventions, like for synergists, <laughs> too exciting, for, for synergists for lower respiratory tract infection, extinctual virus. I mean, we have a monoclonal antibody that's pre-exposure prophylaxis for pediatric patients that are at risk for um, severe events at early life. So, I mean, we have much more than vaccines in our toolkit. And I think it's kind of great that so much research being done on this virus that we actually have a tool set that we're developing and vaccines are kind of like a great way to scale up a result rather quickly. But as we start thinking about the long COVID, long-term outcomes of patients that have COVID, very similar to how MERS and SARS back in 2009 and 10 have long-term outcomes today, there are so many things that we can target beyond just focusing on a vaccine to produce a preventive response at rates that we're still trying to anticipate. So I think having this data is kind of where I get more excited and less pessimistic of so much collaborative effort and focus that we haven't really seen in a world beforehand. And especially for a technology that is rather antiquated itself and pedestrian. I mean, we don't really have a personalized vaccine right now. And I think this might be a good foray to start thinking of what a personalized vaccine would look like as we're developing more N of one precision medicine. So it's kind of like a good booster shot for the industry itself to start focusing on 
novel innovations and novel iterations of techniques that we've classically relied upon that have always had certain affordances that we just accepted and we don't really have to accept those anymore which is where I get excited looking at those kind of um, visualizations. So Gary, thank you for sharing that. So uh, off of what Carla just said, I'd like to reverse shout out um, Balaji Severinsen, uh, who gave us a shout out on the Eric Weinstein's Portal podcast uh, that um, he talked about in that podcast, all of the innovations that are finally able to get through the door because of COVID just radically shaking stuff up and a lot of the cruft that is, has developed in places is shaken loose and innovations and change can make its way through. And as you were saying, Carlo, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of not terrible that um, comes out of just the amount of change caused by the COVID pandemic. And so, you know, it's not all coughing. Um, some of it ha can have positive knock-on effects to the rest of the way that the world works. And, you know, in, like I know I've, I've been beaten down quite a bit by just the, the failure of things as they've unfolded, but um, I'm rebuilding myself with a little bit more hope. And so I wanted to just kind of reference that hope and uh, that there are positive things and we're kind of a part of it. So uh you know that that's uh that's some good in the world that uh comes out of the bad the silver lining so to speak so some of the questions that we have in the chat here um i think we've kind of brushed on this first question but i i think it's good to go into um the kind of uh the potential downsides of vaccination, given the amount of, I guess I could term it psychological challenge that has resulted from uh, the spread of the pandemic lockdown and people's reactions to it. Could it be that a vaccine doesn't help to get the zero since no one might be willing to put in the effort necessary to eliminate it anymore if there's a vaccine at least for the people with the power to um, crush the curve. I think, you know, my knee-jerk static public health response is always social determinants of health matter, which include the, the medical space itself, the medical infrastructure, drugs, treatment, caregiving. There is the economics of health outcomes. Um, there's the environmental influence, which we're all experiencing from social distancing and just environments influencing collapse of space where people actually have to interact closely together. There's food insecurity, which I think shouldn't really need to be described, but education is, is rather one of the more influential um, social determinants of health, of health literacy, even just um, situation awareness of education. So I think we can't neglect the fact that just because we have vaccine doesn't mean that we're tackling all those other spokes on the wheel of trying to impact and drive health outcomes. So we have to make sure that we're not just innovating in one domain of technology of vaccines themselves, as good or poor as they are, but also making sure that we're driving those other factors that will actually generate buy-in, generate consensus, and generate um, a, a decent strong-arm response to get people to not comply, but to actually want to to buy into it because they either believe the impact, they believe the outcomes, or they can adjust the risk management themselves to, to want to go through this process. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And the vaccine is just one tool. Hopefully it's a very good tool, but it needs to be combined with a lot of other efforts. It's just one factor. Luckily that uh, answer works for any health question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, I would also say that, you know, I, I can see that concern that, you know, if you have a vaccine, there's going to be, I am sure, a push to reopen more. There's going to be, I am sure, a drop in precaution taking. And yes, if you have a vaccine that protects against infection, if you have an incredibly effective vaccine, and a really good vaccination campaign in the country, you might be able to get to a level where you stop transmission in the country. But even if you can do that, 
and the chances of us having a vaccine that is that good with a vaccination campaign that is that successful is another debatable question. But even if you're able to do that, you have all the surrounding areas that might not have that level of a vaccination campaign, may not have access to that vaccine, may have access to a poorer vaccine. And then you have continuous exposure to the virus coming in from other areas. It's like what we always say about green zones. If you're in a green zone yourself, well, that's great. But green zones are only really effective when they're surrounded by other green zones. Yeah, green zones making more green zones is the ideal. Can Not they, to have green zones versus red zones kind of playing out. That's That doesn't seem as ideal. Jeremy, real quick, um, can you have like a corridor effect with green zones? Like uh, say um, Austria and New Zealand, for example. Could that work? Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, people do you know, people are doing green zone travel corridors and arrangements between countries, and it requires, a, you know, really clear guidelines as to how you're defining that, and it requires very clear guidelines as to the actions and precautions each country or each region are taking, and I think that's difficult to maintain in practice, but in theory, sure. Yeah, so, so it sounds like you'd have to sign some sort of agreement of practices with the other country. And then any other country that signs on with you is going to have to sign on with those other agreements or want to change them. So that that looks like a, a, a pretty messy political issue. It's one of those things that, you know, certain geographies offer certain affordances that other ones classically wouldn't. We also have to have a culture inside the, the, the country itself where Australia really is primed to be one of the best organizations and, and uh, municipalities that focuses on biodiversity spread and try to uh, block unwanted biodiversity. So it's kind of like they already have these operations in place that allow them to be successful in certain corridors or preventing certain spreads that they already have built into practice. I mean, you can kind of look to, to Middle East and, and Asian countries that were primed to respond to SARS and MERS already because it's not their first rodeo. So it's kind of like, it's great in, in, in thought and practice, but it's kind of like, if we want to really do that, we have to look to the countries that have been very successful at doing it from past experience and to figure out why that worked culturally as opposed to just taking that practice and try force fitting it into whatever we're trying to do at the same time. So matching cultures with operations and the outcomes that we're trying to drive at the same time. So that, that seems to um, make the uh, green zones um, on a country by country basis even more complicated. Is that right, Carla? Yes. Yeah, I mean that. Okay, I mean that. That that sounds like a real tall uh, tower to climb. I would say it makes it hypothetically possible and in reality improbable. Right. There's um. There's a quote on my website for Face Corporation. Why do you think your values would work in a culture that they don't understand? So it's, it's the classic constraint for most issues that we have in the world is communication barriers and also not knowing why things work and making assumptions. So, I mean, COVID-19, we don't have the luxury of making assumptions without knowing what those assumptions elicit from that practice. So it's one of those things we have to be very comprehensive and gestalt for what we're implementing and understanding that we probably won't think of everything. So we should be agile and responsive as opposed to leaning into what we think is right. Ah, all right. Yeah, the green zones. Um, I'm I'm very excited about them, but uh, it's not like a snap of the fingers kind of process to build that. Um, I I I don't know if there's much more to say on that in relation to vaccines. Does anyone have green zones plus vaccines thoughts that they want to go into before we move on to kind of the next topic? It'll be a bit of a big one. All right, so we have two questions that I think go well together. So I'm gonna read them as one question then reread the first question because it'll be a good, really good jumping off um, starting point. Uh, I keep hearing that we must be close since there are vaccines in phase three trials. 
what is the process that vaccines go through and what still lies ahead? And then in terms of efficacy, the FDA has stated that it will only approve vaccines that prevent or reduce symptoms in 50% of the population that is vaccinated. Dr. Fauci has said that he would be happy with a vaccine that is 70 to 75% effective. Can the panel talk about the implications of the range of effectiveness? What levels of perfection is provided to the individual, um, perhaps kind of uh, herd immunity dynamics, which um, most of that is actually taken from vaccination campaigns and not really related to acquired immunity. Um, and it's this conflation that's a real screwdriver to brain um, conversation happening on the internet. And then what level of protection is provided to the larger population? Perhaps contact, um, co contrast this range with some well-known vaccines, uh, such as flu, and measles and um, some of the disease that we've sent extinct. And so what is the, uh, what is the process? Um, what still lies ahead? And what does phase three trials mean? I'm happy to take the second part, but Carlo or Gary, if you'd like to go through the, the phase three clinical trials. So uh, I'll give a quick overview and then Carlo maybe expands. Uh, phase one is small limited pilot trials just to show that people don't drop dead or develop three heads after taking a medication. Uh, phase one is to establish safety uh, and uh, really doesn't relate to whether or not it impacts the disease that you're trying to treat or prevent. Phase two is still limited scale but beginning to look once you've cleared the safety hurdle, beginning to look at whether it actually impacts the disease. Now, safety is still looked at through phase two. And then phase three is large scale. Large scale and typically longer time period to say, okay, we did a first crack at seeing if this is both safe and that we have enough reason to think that it helps with the problem to justify giving it to large number of people. And now we're going to go large with it. Thanks. I think just to add the, the peculiarity of what vaccines force you to figure out is like most other clinical trials are trying to impact a surrogate endpoint in order to reduce a health or to drive a health outcome. But for vaccines, the best case scenario is that nothing bad happens. So you have to challenge the patients to be able to see would they take an infection, which is a, a risky scenario, especially because we know we don't really know how to anticipate or be able to predict responses for individuals, uh, individuals really at a great rate. So the added complexity is not only are you doing clinical trial that is designed to fail, clinical trials fail at a very high rate. Now you're doing something a little bit more peculiar. We actually have to do a challenge onto the individual once you receive the vaccine to see like, how does this population of individuals that you've increased at scale at the largest size before approval? And then now you're adding additional risk value to it as well. So um, that's kind of the last little aspect, as well as the very comprehensive review of what would need to be done for the analysis of that data to then submit it to the FDA for their final thumbs up. And we're lucky that the FDA is kind of really all about safety, and then we'll kind of aim for efficacy of how we looked at other accelerated appro approvals for other indications in the space. So we might ride the tail of safety and really hope for efficacy, and hopefully that's enough in the near future. Where I, I think I might want to just bring up that little portion, Gary and Jeremy, do you have any ideas on your thoughts on non-inferiority trials for COVID-19 vaccines? All yours, Jeremy. <laughs> well, no, Car Carlo, you, you, you have some thoughts. So if you want to start, I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, it's like once we have a vaccine, it showcases that there's a value for other companies to start producing vaccines that are not as good as the standard what we're looking for. And if we're thinking about the potential logistics constraints, we might accept poor quality vaccines by other manufacturers in order to get enough to the market. Since it's one of those things that, you know, not only will we have more than vaccines, we might be comfortable with having non-inferior or potentially easier to administer products going into the future. So that's kind of where I get excited and concerned about more industry focus, but 
more vaccines doesn't always mean a better thing for everyone. And I think it's such an important factor because there, there's no one vaccine and there's not going to be any one vaccine and it's not going to be a static thing either. This is going to be changing and evolving as we get more data, but also as new vaccines come into the market and as the marketplace starts to change. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be incredibly complicated. Now, in terms of the, the sort of second half of that question, in terms of the efficacy of the vaccine and, you know, Fauci saying he'd accept something that's, you know, 70 to 75 percent effective and that needs to be at least 50. So I'll, I'll give you an example of an existing vaccine that I would imagine a large number of us here have had which is the flu vaccine. So the flu vaccine ranges from say 35 to 65% effective any year. Some years it's down to 35 and in some age groups, it's virtually zero. And yet we have that every year and it's recommended by public health officials to get the vaccine every year because even at a low effectiveness, it still helps both on a population level as well as on an individual level. Because yes, it might not prevent you from getting infected. I mean, how many people have you heard of complaining and saying, oh, I got the flu, I feel terrible. And can you believe it? I even got vaccinated too. You hear that a lot. But first of all, how many of those cases were actually diagnosed as flu? That's a whole other story. But just because you got vaccinated doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be protected from getting infected. But the important thing is that if you're vaccinated, frequently that can help mitigate how severe of a disease you get and how long you're infected and your likelihood of transmitting it to other people. So it can help personally and it can help on a population level. And if we think about the investment and the attention that we've gotten from antiviral drugs like remdesivir, a vaccine is a much easier thing. This is like, even if it doesn't work to prevent infection, this is like a preventative antiviral that would help to reduce the severity and the critical cases of the disease. So yes, we're all hoping that we have a vaccine that actually stops infection. That's that's what we're hoping for. But even if we don't, that doesn't mean it's not useful. So yeah, you can go fairly low on the effectiveness scale as long as the vaccine is safe and still have a benefit to the population. So again, flu vaccine, depending on the year, that range, but it's also affected by the age and the you know, pre-existing health conditions of the population because we're talking about COVID disease being the most critical in patients that are elderly or with pre-existing health conditions. Vaccines tend to work less effectively in the elderly population. The flu vaccine year on year might be 60% effective in you know, healthy young adults, but might be 5% effective in over 80s. So we have to be paying attention to that when we're looking at the vaccine also. I would just like to contrast by another vaccine that is extraordinarily effective at preventing infection. That's the measles vaccine. One dose of the measles vaccine is around 95% effective. Two doses, you're getting about 99% effective. And that's another important point, is that the effectiveness of one dose can often be increased by a booster shot. So we might be low in effectiveness after just one shot, but you might get a booster and be in much better shape. So it's, and we just don't know. So we have vaccines over a wide range and they're all useful. It's just, do they stop infection? And can we get to a point of eliminating COVID or does it just dramatically help?
So one um, version of this that I think might be a probable version is that we get a first generation or a first wave of vaccination and places in the first world that can afford that first round will get a somewhat effective um, shot, which maybe means that the COVID spread is manageable and illnesses are less fatal. So your fatality rate goes down, but, and your overall infection rate goes down, but they're still there. You still get long COVID and many places in the rest of the world don't get it. There's plenty of um, reservoirs of the disease that are still active. World travel is going to suffer um, still for, from that. And three or four years later, there will be a next generation or second wave with booster shots. And then we might be able to get, um, you know, and a, a vaccine that prevents long COVID that reduces the disease so much that we might be able to get it extinct in places where we have the, you know, global, like the resources to deploy a, you know, extinction effort campaign. And so then places can vaccinate into green zones, but that's like 2025 or maybe 2023, given the accelerated um, approach that uh, the vaccination, you know, um, community, the scientific and technical community is taking to get things as deployed as fast as possible. And so then we're looking at three or four years to safety in the first world, but maybe a decade before COVID is no longer something that you see in the news. Is that kind of like a, a good, like best probability guess model, or is there something that um, we sh we should be expecting that's radically different from that? I, I think the one thing I'd like to add to make that to the best model as well is that there's much more than COVID nineteen happening outside. If we had this huge pilgrimage of people getting into healthcare and getting into the hands of care providers to get a vaccine, we have an opportunity to probably do one of the best. I'm going to call this like a health census, like how we have the census for populations here in the States. We have the opportunity to actually proactively and intentionally start documenting in a secure and, and safe fashion, a novel way to start organizing clinical care data and make one of the best patient registries on earth on, on the entire globe, probably ever at any point in time. That I think if we start thinking about healthcare on trying to make an impact and not just healthcare to fix COVID-19, we have such a great opportunity to actually drive outcomes beyond COVID-19. So I think if you start planning that into your scenario, you can start getting to that best practice and realizing there was health issues before we had a pandemic. And this is a nice way to get more people to care settings, get them enrolled to Medicare benefits, highlight the disparities of Medicare and Medicaid, and start thinking about routes of access to drive global health outcomes while fixing a pandemic at the same time. So I think if you're trying to get best model scenario, you need to make sure that you're driving health outcomes, not just COVID-19 surrogate endpoints of cellular response and humoral responses for antigens. I think this is such an important point. And it's, I, I think we have such an opportunity and such a risk right here because this is not the only outbreak going on right now. This is not the only disease. This is not going to be the only disease. So what, you know, for instance, what does measles vaccination look like in the world five years from now? We have an opportunity here to strengthen health systems, to strengthen vaccination campaigns, to strengthen messaging campaigns, to increase vaccine uptake and awareness. We also have a very real risk of getting that wrong and making things much worse. And we have to remember, it's not just affecting COVID. This has long-term impacts on such a wide range of outcomes around the world. All right. Um, I think the, the next question that wasn't covered by that conversation, which by the way, the, the kind of health census and the like reboot of medicine for the 21st century. Um, really, there's, there's so much good that can come out of that. 
um, that uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you added that in, Carlo, as part of the model um, that, uh, you know, it, it's not just deploying the vaccine, but it's potentially deploying a whole new approach to healthcare that means that millions of people with um, perhaps chronic and debilitating problems um, can get their, like, th their information into the hands of researchers who can actually start to figure out how to address those chronic issues. Because um, before, so much of the data is so noisy and messy um, that it, it's very difficult to do analysis of stuff. Um, so I, I really like that um, um, as a point. And then uh, a, a really good question um, f from the chat is, for each of you on our panel, what would need to be the case for you to get the vaccine? When would you get it? And how would you change your behavior? Or how would that change your behavior after the vaccination? And I guess I would also add to that, what would be the scenario where you personally would prefer to defer your vaccination? Very context dependent. I would most likely be an early adopter if it appeared to be reasonable and recommended because ultimately at the end of the day, uh, we either have all kinds of alternate facts at our disposal or we have our public health system and its recommendations. And uh, given those choices, if the recommendations seem to have some reason behind them, then I follow them and I put my trust in that not necessarily blindly, not always without some slight reluctance, depending on what the recommendation is, but it generally tends to be more solid than a lot of the alternatives. So now what would alter that would be if there was strong reason to think that something better was going to come up on the horizon shortly. And I'd have to be gauging that probability and, and, and the quality of that information. So that's where we get into some of the tricky Dis discussions that Carlo and I were alluding to earlier. Um, how would it change the behavior? Also very dependent on the context at the time. Uh, what would appear to be the prevalence? Uh, how much mask wearing was going on in the community and why? Whether there were travel restrictions in place that were working, et cetera. Uh, because again, for the same reason why I would get vaccinated in the first place, it would be to do my part in trying to help the overall population reduce its susceptibility and not waste resources on something that's effectively preventable. Thanks. I already got a vaccine because I'm part of a trial, so <laughs> can't really answer that one anymore. Which one? Already on board. <laughs> nice. Carlo, which, uh, Jeremy asked, which uh, trial are you part of? one of the many factors out there. You can drop it so, in the chat or private message Jeremy just uh, to satisfy his curiosity if you want. But Jeremy, go ahead with your take on vaccination personally. Uh, Carla, did you have something else you were going to? Rhymes with MasterZeneca. So for me, it would be yeah, I completely agree with Gary. It's context dependent. Um, I would want to see the data. I would want to know what vaccine I have access to versus what is coming available. Um, because first of all, I, I have a concern and we'll see how grounded this is, but I have a concern about vaccines being rushed through with a political motivation to get them licensed before we have enough safety data on them. And I think we would have decent safety data on them. I think we're getting safety data on it, but I do have a concern about that because we're already starting to see that. In Russia, we just saw an announcement very recently that they are going to license their vaccine and start producing and vaccinating in August, 
despite the fact that they haven't published anything and they haven't completed phase two clinical trials. So I am approaching with optimism, but also caution. I would want to make sure that we have data because we don't yet understand how the immune system is responding to the virus. We don't yet understand what if you have pre-existing immunity to one of the other coronaviruses and then get vaccinated. There's a lot that we don't understand yet. So I want to make sure, especially given the fact that we're seeing a lot of, you know, things like pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndromes. We're seeing a lot of diverse inflammatory syndromes in people. And we're seeing a lot of protracted syndromes and a lot of protracted inflammation in people. I would like to know that the safety data is looking good on the vaccine before I get it. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing, and I would be willing to wait on a vaccine that looks safer or better if I knew that was coming down the pipeline. The second thing is that in terms of effectiveness, yes, I might wait a little bit if I knew there was a much better vaccine in terms of effectiveness coming down the pipeline, or I might get a second dose of a different vaccine. But in terms of effectiveness, I'm willing to take a much lower level because I think that that will affect dramatically transmission in the community and my risk of severe disease. So I'm not quite as bothered as that. I'm hoping for good effectiveness, but I'm not as bothered by that. In terms of what precautions I would take myself, that is very context dependent because if I got a vaccine that was you know, equivalent to the measles vaccine and I'm not going to get infected, then the precautions I'm gonna take are gonna be a little bit different if it's a vaccine that's 30% effective and is just going to reduce some of the disease. Also, the precautions that I take, if there's robust community level transmission, are different from the precautions that I would take if I'm in a green zone. So again, I'm paying attention to precautions and vaccines as one more tool kit in my precaution taking and what I can do to help my community get to zero. Vaccines are one tool. They're potentially a game-changing tool, but not necessarily. So it's all in context, and I would be factoring all of that together in order to determine what my behavior is. So I do want to add one little thing. Talk? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm still going to be a very knowledgeable consumer, but to the point where Gary and Jeremy are talking about looking at the clinical data, it's checking out the primary endpoints and secondary endpoints of what was the intended impact from the clinical trials and trying to understand what that means for myself at a patient-centric level. Just because, you know, certain drugs are measured on the population benefit versus myself and being able to see how other products compare. But outside of that, I'm really, uh, I'm really pragmatic when it comes to chemistry, manufacturing, and controls of products, especially ones that have a very narrow uh, supply chain effort. And that just means all the stuff that goes in making sure that it's high quality and, you know, monitored in some way, shape, or form or fashion. So I, I do myself my own diligence drive on the manufacturers, the APIs, the, dist the distributed supply chain. And my go-to resource anytime I take a new generic drug for myself or my family is going on to FDA Zilla myself and saying like, oh, wow, they didn't have that many great site inspections. Maybe I should switch to another generic and say that I don't really have a decent adverse event profile for this drug. So I am really, when it comes to commodity products, I'm really vigilant in that for my own life. And my, my, my loved ones, but for the vaccine, I would do no different than that. So, so Carlo, you took the one uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. They're going on. No. no not that one. Okay. Uh, so I, I would like to jump in, um, even though I'm not technically the panelist, but add my own thoughts here, because I think it would be interesting and unique. I... Um, have had a chronic productive cough since January. Uh, so some kind of mild pneumonia. Um, and so that has been something that's happened to me multiple times after like a bout of cold or flu or some kind of upper respiratory thing throughout my life. And I, at, early in COVID, I did a calculation. I have like four risk factors, um, asthma, 
uh, like, and like three or four others. I've also lived uh, with that kind of chronic illness multiple times in my life for like, you know, can last for six months as it has now or for longer. Um, so that's just like, you know, a cough. It's like once an hour I have to cough and that's kind of miserable. But also I've lived with chronic pain for six years. And so I'm very like, and I've also gone through bouts of clinical depression where it's so bad that I get um, depressive brain fog. And so I've, I've been through pretty much most of the symptoms that are associated with long COVID. I am terrified, absolutely terrified of long COVID. And so like that scares me more than dying of COVID. Like dying, it'd be like, ah, damn, um, you know, that, that's bad. But like long COVID, like I've been through enough of this stuff. I'm, I'm less afraid of death because that's, you know, just wink and goodbye. And like long-term loss of function and suffering, the amount of anguish that you can experience going through that um, is truly terrible. And having gotten mostly to the other side of that kind of thing, I do not want to, again, I do not want to go through it again. So I would be, I'd be willing to take a, a vaccine that doesn't prevent the disease, but prevents long COVID at the drop of a hat. And if I don't, and otherwise I'm in the Pacific Northwest and have a decent amount of control over like my own um, personal risk factors and or ve vectors. And I have a like relatively long experience with living in a lockdown. It's so I would might be willing otherwise to wait quite a bit um, for a vaccine that's known to be effective so I can shift modes from constantly fearing the disease all the time to being kind of, okay, I am immune. And so I will take precautions that are good for everybody else, but I don't have to be paranoid anymore. Um, I would rather that be a binary switch instead of like a sliding scale, just because psychologically it's, it would be a lot more easy and comfortable. Um, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on all that. I think any opportunity that a patient can be a shared decision maker when it comes to managing their healthcare journey and being able to personify their own health advocacy is very powerful because you get somebody that, you know, will comply or adhere, adhere to a treatment plan or care guidelines uh, going forward. So I think even just going through the motions of thinking about that equips you to realize that maybe you should consider palliative care as part of reducive suffering, making sure they're comprehensively thinking about mental health and just realizing that it's more than just the vaccine your body you have to plan for. So I think it's it's a very mature response and everyone should do that for any healthcare decision. But one that has such long impacts, you need to make a very quotient decision and then realize what that's going to drive your, your patient journey individually and for those around you for this disease. Yeah, it's... Like I, when I, when I think about it and I don't know enough about vaccines to technically detail the different outcomes that I would be um, facing the decision on, the thing I don't want is a so-so vaccine that probably stops the disease or does nothing. Um, you know, like a, you know, 50% chance of not getting COVID, 50% chance of getting regular COVID without major mitigation of long COVID like that kind of disease where either your immune system picks it up or doesn't, but you're kind of tossing a coin. Like that's the kind of thing where you have the vaccine and can't relax any of your behavioral practices if you're thinking about it, you know, and lots of people are going to relax their behavioral practices. So you have to really have, probably want to be more careful the f ensuing months because there might actually be more spread. And that's the kind of vaccine that I, like it would probably be good for you know total population outcomes, but it would not be psychologically the kind of thing that I want to deal with in my life. I would rather just stay on lockdown and wait for a better vaccine, especially if that kind of vaccine interfered with, interfered with a later superior um, injection. So I, I would also, I would say that typically any vaccine 
that maybe has a 50% effectiveness or something like that is going to have a much more dramatic effect on lowering disease severity. So it's not, you typically won't get a vaccine that, you know, maybe you have a 50% chance of getting the disease, but if you get it, it's just as severe as normal. You might have a 50% chance of getting the disease, but then if you do get it, you are down to maybe a, you know, a significantly lower chance of getting severe disease than you would have others otherwise, because almost always that's an added benefit. I don't know of any vaccine that just protects or doesn't, but if you get infected, you have exactly the same rate of severe disease. Uh, Gary or Carlo, unless you know of one that does. There's a clear benefit of going to a care scenario, having somebody document your benchmarks, having somebody assess you and being able to start talking about your comprehensive healthcare journey with a care provider. Why get a vaccine, making sure that's part of your, your narrative as well. So even if you get no benefit besides getting a healthcare scenario appointment and having a follow-up, even that provides a benefit, especially when you can start screening for other diseases. Let's not forget there's more than just COVID out there. All right, um, I'm going through the questions here. Are there, in general, ways to make vaccines more effective? Booster shots were mentioned. Are there other aspects that in, can improve effectiveness? For example, timing the receiving of the vaccine with like a hormonal cycle or um, uh, coordinated strategic administration, whatever that um, is intended to mean or perhaps like, you know, having like a, like a certain available, like bioavailability availability of vitamins or something that you could control in your behavior to um, amplify the effect of the administration. I'll start that off and then let some folks who actually know elaborate. But uh, what we've seen in the last few years in a lot of areas, and in this pandemic specifically with the modeling, is a better understanding of networked effects. And the immune system is a highly networked system. So it will be interesting as these vaccines roll out and we understand what they're doing in populations to then start optimizing for timing. The other area that's tricky, of course, will be adjuvants because you can't just take a different adjuvant and start playing in combinations without kind of restarting your whole phase one, phase two, uh, you know, two th things may be safe separately, doesn't mean you can combine them and get good effect. Um, but, uh, but the math that we've expanded, so uh, for better understanding of this pandemic and how it spreads through populations, some of that math combined with some genomic medicine and uh, advances in those directions may help us optimize some timing of doses and, and dosing strategies. I'm muting. I think it's it's good to start thinking of the posology of the vaccines and how we're going to be making it specific for the individual person as we start administrating it. And that's kind of what a phase four trial kind of is or an observational pharmacovigilance, which I don't think they, the question asked earlier about the phase three, but there's stuff after phase three that we do to start refining some of those details as we introduce it to a broader population. But I think instead of trying to find um, a magic formula of what to do outside of that, I mean, it's just reducing your comorbidities by, you know, managing your asthma, trying to, you know, develop decent life habit skills that, you know, everyone tells you to drink water, sleep, get consistent rest, uh, mindfulness. I mean, nothing is really exciting or, or sex about any of that, but it's, you know, it's good things to do outside of the pandemic, even better to do when those comorbidities drive risk factors for COVID-19. Thank you, Vanna Schissiver, Vanna White. So, yeah, I, I would also just like to say that, I mean, I, I, there are 
lots of things that can make vaccines more effective. Adjuvants, timing of doses, number of boosters, you know, there, there are a lot of varieties. I mean, the example is if you go and, you know, you look at a childhood vaccine series, some you get one shot, some you get multiple shots, some you need a whole series, some you get the shots in rapid succession, some you have a long gap, some have adjuvants, some have don't, some you get in different body sites. You know, there are lots of different things that you can do that affect how effective the vaccine is. But the issue is that the majority of those have to be addressed within the clinical trial. And so we are to an extent limited by the fact that we are going through a limited number of clinical trials to get the data as quickly as we can right now. So when we come out and first have our first vaccines, we are going to have a limited number of options in terms of the ways to put it together. And that's just the, the reality. Now, over time, I am sure if the virus still exists, which I'm pretty sure it will, we are, will probably be optimizing that. And so maybe a couple of years down the line, we'll have a slightly better formulation, we'll have a slightly better series, we'll know something more that allows that to be effective. But right now, I think the main things that people are playing around with is obviously the type of vaccine and the dosage and things like that. But right now, the two main factors within any vaccine that people are playing around with is the dosage, how much of the vaccine you're giving people, and whether or not you get one or multiple boosters. I think where I get even more excited for forward thinking, I'm 10 years out, is the cellular and regenerative medicine when we extract white blood cells, do some pokey pokey science and put it back in people's bodies. And we, we've been doing this for, for cancer for a little bit of time right now. And I get more excited about personalized vaccine regimens or personalized cellular therapies to impact personalized outcomes. And I can kind of see that being a, a novel entry point with all, as much focus as we have on one disease, one epidemiology that we're discovering more about every day and one cohort of the entire world, that it could be the prime boost that we need to start getting back to more precision medicine, personalized efforts, and, and realizing there's a whole suite of technologies out there, but it's cool to keep working with the one that's been around for a couple hundred years. Okay, so I have kind of a topic shift question that I want to go into because I think it would be good, um, especially for the life of this video up on the internet. Um, and so adjuvants, um, when I kind of dug into the, the world of um, anti-vax, um, kind of to see what people were... Uh, up in arm of, arms about it was a lot of it was adjuvants and um, potential harm associated with that um, that they were uh, talking about. And so, what are adjuvants? Um, it's a word. What does it mean? And then, kind of a second um, approach to kind of the same thought space would be: what are the real tangible risks? And how should people think about them in terms of vaccines? Um, perhaps both as like adults receiving a vaccine and as a parent of a child. Um, and then uh, we'll probably uh, find some more to discuss as that unfolds. Jeremy, do you want to start as the virologist or Carlo as the sort of medicine and technical expert. Gary as the doctor. Any of you guys? All right. So, you know, adjuvants are something that you're putting in a vaccine. It's not the core of the vaccine. It's not typically what you're making the immune response to. It's not what is going to generate the protective immune response to the pathogen. So you might have a vial of the virus, killed the virus that's your vaccine, and you want to put something in it to make it work better. That's an adjuvant. Now, vaccines work because they induce an immune response to the pathogen or the virus in this case. So typically, 
the problem is that, that maybe the vaccine doesn't induce enough of an immune response. It's not quite strong enough to develop that lasting immunity. Or perhaps it develops a strong immune response, but it only develops a very specific immune response. And you want to shift the immune response to a different side or a different angle to develop a more broad immune response. So in that case, what you can do is you can add an adjuvant and most adjuvants tend to activate the immune system. They tend to be substances and chemicals that have broad immune stimulatory mechanisms. And the reason why this is good is you are enhancing your immune activation to what you're putting in there. So you're giving a lot of this virus and then you're activating the immune system a lot. So that means you're generating a very robust immune response to what you're putting into the body. And this has a better chance of translating to long-term immunity. So this is why people add it. This is why it tends to be effective. It's not always necessary, but it does tend to make a stronger immune response. Now, the downside of that, if it is a downside, is that you run the risk of having a very strong immune response. And as we know, immune responses are associated with a lot of symptoms and can make people sick. You know, the reason why you have a fever and chills when you're sick is because of your immune response to the pathogen. So if you stimulate your immune response a lot more, then you tend to have more of these symptoms. And in a limited number of people, they can have really robust immune responses that can sometimes cause damage or sometimes cause autoimmunity. Again, this is a minority, but this is where the idea of personalized medicine comes in. Because if we understood how individual people were responding, we could dial in something very specific. But that's why you're adding it, but that's also the risk is that you want to make sure you're generating a strong immune response that creates immunity. But you don't want to make it so strong that you end up causing damage or any adverse effects. All right. Um, yeah, so I would lay personify that with the adjuvant would perhaps take a 50% vaccine and to become a 70% vaccine. And it would take a partial immunity so you don't get as sick when you get infected to maybe being full immunity where you don't get sick. And so those are some of the benefits and kind of the downside is you might get the vaccine and then it hops to your immune system. You have a fever and fever can um, do harm if it gets out of control. So there are sort of added risks in that dimension that maybe um, you could manage with a cold pack. Carlo, you want to jump in? And this is getting back to when we have more than one vaccine, we have to be knowledgeable consumers because for a population of 330-ish million people in the US of A, and we have a vaccine that has an adverse effect profile of 0.3 of 1%, roughly is what a million people have an adverse event you have to plan for. So it's one of those things that vaccines are useful, they are risk managing tools, but if it does have an adverse event profile, that's going to hit the economies of scale as much as it is in anything else. So that's kind of where we do have to make sure that drugs do have adverse, adverse events and we want to be able to mitigate or anticipate them as much as possible um, and be able to compare them from one product to the next. So it's kind of like if there is a risk, making sure that we know that it's going to be presented as we put it into larger population and new profiles will manifest that we didn't observe in a very small trial. This is one of the things you have to be very cognizant about and, and know that those risks are going to be prevalent uh, whichever way we go. I mean, we're seeing that with disease symptoms for COVID right now. We have so many cases that even if the occurrence of a specific symptom is an incredibly small percentage of people, we have enough people infected right now that we're seeing that. So when we're talking about a vaccination campaign on this scale, our likelihood of observing any adverse effect is much larger. So, you know, it's, that is something that we have to be aware of, but paying attention to adverse effects is also important, especially when you think of the anti-vax movement and thinking about long-term vaccination, because 
you know, the last thing that you want with a COVID vaccination campaign is to give any fuel to the anti-vax movement and any validation that says, ah, yes, vaccines actually cause a problem. And so now I'm not going to go vaccinate against measles. So we need to be really careful and cautious, both about how we're messaging and wording, as well as the vaccine itself. Right, kind of the the cost benefit of vaccines is spectacularly good, especially when we're careful about vaccines and do a good job with them. And they're they can be incredibly effective, like measles. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's no cost on the cost side. It's usually relatively small to the individual, but certainly compared to the totality of society, it is um, tiny compared with the harm done by the diseases that the vaccine could prevent. Um, probably a good summary. And it's all part of the messaging. It's all part of actually making that information available and clear and talking to people about it. So I, I guess I want to ask one more time um, on, or like one more thing on the topic of the harm of vaccines, um, you know, so we don't skirt around the issue because I, I think this is an important one and we have the opportunity to message and like really be clear about it in a way um, that most people might not be able to is what are the likely harm outcomes of a vaccine? Like, what does that look like? You know, is it like you get a fever or is it, you know, like you get some kind of potentially permanent damage of some kind? And, you know, what are the probabilities of that um, that we kind of know from, uh, you know, the scaled um, vaccine deployment and stuff? I, I I personally would be very cautious on commenting on the probabilities because you're talking about novel vaccine technologies being applied against a novel pathogen. And so we're into uh, relatively unknown territory. And uh, with the vaccine overall attrition rate from the start of development to licensing of about 90%, it gives you some idea of what some of the problems along the way. And some of that 90% is represented in that transition from phase two to phase three, that there is a history of things showing up in phase three, whether it's economic infeasibility or other things, but sometimes the things do. Um, broadly, you're most likely gonna be in the area of either ineffectiveness or in terms of side effects, some sort of over-triggering of the immune system. And that can have as wide a range as the number of autoimmune diseases. Uh, things like uh, kidney susceptibility, uh, fever would be one of the mildest. Actually, oddly enough, right now, I think insomnia is showing up as an early mild side effect, uh, I believe, of the Moderna vaccine. Um, but, uh, and I frankly don't have a good explanation for that using that uh, immune hyperreactivity. I'm not sure anyone has gotten to the bottom of that one, um, unless it's that people are so immersed in COVID culture that, that it's keeping up keeping them up at night. Um, but again, uh, if the, you think the, the terrible trials of uh, what conf it's, it, it's not conflation. What's the technical term and statistics for this? You know, confounders. Confounders, uh, the, the terrible troubles of t confounders. So, um, but if you think of the things that autoimmune illnesses can cause and the body systems they can affect, if we see side effects, I would say it's going to be somewhere in that spectrum. Also, you know, lot numbers of vaccines, you can look to see some of the compensation from, was it the Navy for the anthrax vaccine for some of the issues that it provided upon administration? So it's more so, you know, if it's a great vaccine, there's still issues with the chemistry, manufacturing and controls of those lots. Then we have to make sure that we're not rushing things for the sake to get it, but making sure that we're being very compliant, especially when we're sourcing materials from a place that doesn't really have the best quality history um, in the market. So it's um, more so than the biology and science itself, it's just the business and industry of these vaccines. We have to make sure that we're being very vigilant on continuously. What's a better word for that? That we make sure that's always in our focus as we're thinking about this on a monitoring perspective as well. 
there's multiple vulnerabilities from the design of the drug to its administration that may have nothing to do with specifically the drug itself, but it's packaging in the supply chain. I mean, it's, it's so important because I think that there is going to be a lot of sort of overall public perception about the vaccine when in reality we are going to be talking about a lot of different vaccines, a lot of different batches manufactured by a lot of different companies at a lot of different times. And that's not all comparable. I mean, the, you know, I, when we had the last pandemic in 2009, we had the swine flu vaccine. And overall, the swine flu vaccine was very, very safe. Most people had, you know, maybe a little bit of fever, you know, something like that. It was fairly mild, but there was one batch that was associated with a low rate of induction of narcolepsy. And it's, you know, it's, again, this is probably something that in a normal year for a normal vaccine would never be seen. But it was a massive vaccination campaign with a large number of people. And we, so we saw even small effects. So, you know, there is that, that problem and it's something that we need to be aware of. And I think Gary also made a really important point here, um, you know, which is that some of these vaccine platforms, so we haven't talked about the different types of vaccines that are being developed, but some of these vaccine platforms have never been licensed yet and never been used sort of in a long term. So we don't have a long history of saying, okay, this way of making a vaccine doesn't cause any ver adverse long-term effects. Now, it might not. And it's, it's very probable that, you know, what we see in the clinical trials holds up, but we don't know that yet. Some of the vaccines, we have a lot longer term safety data on that type of making a vaccine. So it's just, there are so many different parameters and variables here, whether it's the type of vaccine, the manufacturer, the dose, the booster, it's, it's really important to be paying attention. But I also think that, you know, when you talk about patients, because this is what it's about, it's about people. When you're talking about people getting vaccines and you're talking about people going to the doctor to get a vaccine, it's important what kind of messaging we're using. It's important how we're talking to people. If people are coming in with concerns, are they just being dismissed? Or are we actually talking about them and talking about, okay, why are we saying vaccines are safe? Why are we saying vaccines are important? What is the benefit? This is a discussion that we should be having. That's my opinion. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear this kind of conversation because um, I, I know a couple of people who are kind of anti-vax oriented. And um, one of the big things is that it's like, there are downsides to, like there are harms done by vaccines. They're usually relatively mild, but if you've gone through something like that and you associate it and nobody will just admit that yes, there are things that can go wrong. There's so much better than what happens when you don't have vaccines that um, it's such a simple and good and easy cost benefit analysis that, but if you don't ever hear anyone who's competent and knowledgeable about it, talk about it, then it, it drives this kind of cycle of paranoia that um, is very difficult to break people out of. Absolutely. I think it's so important that we're clearly communicating and clearly communicating, you know, what the situation is and that especially at a patient level, that when people are coming in, if they're coming in with concerns that we're talking about it, because this is something that can be explained. There, this is not, you know, we have that data for vaccines. We can talk about, you know, if people are coming in before the pandemic and saying, I am concerned for X, Y, and Z about getting the measles vaccine. Well, you can learn about, well, why are you concerned? And then you can talk about, well, okay, look, this is the risk of measles. This is a non-trivial risk. This is an incredibly serious disease 
This is the safety data that we have on the measles vaccine. So the risk of this compared to the risk of measles, they, there's just not even any question anymore. But it's a matter of having that conversation and actually talking about it. And then uh, one last thing I would want to say on uh, vaccines like this and risk management is one of the things that makes vaccines so spectacularly like amazing and good is that they effectively protect us against systemic risks, which we're watching play out in society, in economy, um, in you know our day to day lives, in our quality of life, all this like all of the things that have happened with COVID that are terrible, and we're watching burn through society are the systemic risks that any disease can trigger outside of you know not just the infection itself, but all the things that it can do to society. Vaccines protect us against all of that, not just a little cough. I think that's so important. And what we talk about in terms of COVID prevention in general in ECV is this idea that we are all acting in the benefit, not only of protecting ourselves, but protecting our communities and protecting others. Vaccines work in the same way too. I used the example before of the flu vaccine where we're recommending people getting the flu vaccine, but we're also saying that, yeah, in, in people, you know, over 80 or something, the flu vaccine isn't terribly effective. But if we're all getting vaccinated, we are lowering the risk of the people over 80 of getting the flu. So it's helping us, but it's also helping other people in the community that maybe the vaccine isn't as, help, as effective in, or, or maybe are at higher risk or at higher risk of disease. So it's all of us together. We can help ourselves and help everybody else. All right. Um, I, wanna... I do want to add that last little point that we do want to be able to have a population health benefit driving as much as the individual benefit while managing the risk, but making sure that we don't just take the bad vaccines that we don't value and send it to other countries for them to be able to mitigate these issues as well. It's a global issue, it's a global pandemic, and we have to make sure that we're planning for global health outcomes from a population perspective, otherwise it's gonna rear its head in some way, shape, or form. So I think there's immediate need that we need around the local communities by making sure that we're not putting a quality center in place and then pushing our, our literal refuse into other countries to, to figure out how to, what to do with. Yeah, Carlo, to that point, one of the things that, you know, is it's like a short term economic win for like a small group of people who own that, um, like the, the product, but it isn't just like reduced mitigation of harm in third world countries. This kind of thing can, I would imagine, often mean a risk that finds its way back to us um, the, by creating this kind of externality. Uh, because then that region where that um, defective uh, vaccine was pushed is going to become a reservoir for this disease. And that's the same for other defective vaccines for other diseases. Like these regions that get these, you know, dysfunctional vaccines become re reservoirs. And that means maybe 10, 15 years down the line, there's a second COVID pandemic because there's a new outbreak immunity in much of the world has worn off to some extent. We're not prepared for it. And now we have an endemic um, disease, even if we do a successful fight in the near term. And so we need to be smarter than that and mitigate the totality of the problem. Not, and then that's just from a systemic thinking side, not to mention the compassion side involved where we're just harming people um, instead of taking a financial loss or mitigating a financial loss um, with some kind of uh, economic uh, risk management. A question came up, how can we make sure that it doesn't happen and just making sure that we hold manufacturers or products to be accountable for what they produce. And if it comes to the point where we just, you know, buy it off their hands 
for a reduced price or they just don't sell it somewhere else might be a way to do that and and preventing them from manufacturing it even further i mean lots of research investment and um capital has gone into producing these sort of things and if somebody doesn't buy it they're going to sell it to someone else so to that question of how we can prevent some of these off pushing these resources to other countries is you know reward the people that innovated in the space and, and penalize the ones that are not doing this for the best health outcomes for the global populations Yeah, so, sounds good, Carlo. Uh, I plus one to that. Um, you mentioned a book in um, the chat. You want to mention that um, in the audio? That's a cool book. You should check it out. There's an NPR 40 minute interview with the author that saves you from spending $12 on Amazon for the book. Um, it's just about the industry trends and how we monitor quality control of products internationally and kind of some of the woes and what pitfalls it provides due to our lack of oversight when we are doing this routinely. Now doing it for a pandemic is another story altogether. So we're going to have different driving factors, but it's a decent summary of the industry and the driving factors, what produces quality control issues. And mind you, we get three drug recalls a day in the United States of America by habit. So it's, it's one of those things that as we expedite things, we're going to be cu cutting some corners as an industry and we have to anticipate those as soon as possible. And that is Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom by Catherine Eban. Um, yeah, th this one is, th this particular book has gone around the, the uh, network a couple times, I think, uh, because it appears to be really excellent. I haven't read it, but Garlo recommends it and anything that he recommends um, has got a lot of brain power eating it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll take that as a good recommendation. Um, kind of on the systemic risks and topic of vaccines that's maybe associated with COVID, but um, a little bit beyond as I think we're to the point in our discussion where they're going to transition more to an open chat and a bit of a more hangout energy um, as I think we've covered COVID and vaccines pretty well um, is I know that uh, there's kind of a systemic risk uh, panic isn't the right word but growing fear with uh, antibiotics that we're burning through all of the antibiotics and we might run out of antibiotics um, in the nearish future if we don't manage um, that as like a resource with the development of superbugs and antibiotic resistance and man many of the common bacteria that we as a species encounter. Is there an analog with viruses that we might want to be aware of not necessarily that the viruses will become immune, but that the way that we interact with them evolutionarily will cause a looming future problem. And that we, a little bit of cognition and cognizance of that beforehand could prevent a looming catastrophe. And then perhaps do we, do we have any interest in the um, difference between uh, vaccination for, uh, or, um, for the prevention for bacteria versus vaccines just as a uh, point of topic, because this is a talk on vaccines and that might be interesting. I mean, in terms of the first part on sort of antibiotics versus vaccines, I'd say that no, there's not a corollary with there. Um, you can get it, mutations as we were talking about earlier in viruses that can facilitate escape from vaccines, but there's not really that selective pressure in the same way for vaccines on one specific target. So the issue with antibiotics is twofold. First of all, antibiotics tend to work on one very specific target, one very specific protein or mechanism within a bacteria, whereas vaccines tend to target something broad, even if it's the spike, just the spike protein it's targeting a lot of different regions on the spike protein. So most immune responses generated by vaccines are not as specifically targeted as you would get from an antibiotic. So that's the first thing. And the second thing 
is that your body is naturally fighting the virus. The immune system is boosted by vaccination. So you're doing what you normally do, you just do it more effectively. Whereas antibiotics are something very unusual, an addition that you're adding that has this selective pressure. So if you don't take the full dose of antibiotics, if you don't kill all the bacteria that you're exposed to, or you give it to, you know, in feed for animals that aren't killing all the bacteria that they're exposed to, then the bacteria rapidly evolve, can rapidly evolve resistance because it's one specific target. So usually it can be just a couple small mutations and all of a sudden the bacteria can be resistant. Bacteria can also exchange genes between themselves. So all of this really facilitates that sort of natural selection of bacteria evolving resistance. If you don't have enough antibiotics, or you don't have it for the full course. Whereas there's not really a same analogy with vaccines. Okay, yeah, that is just a curiosity. And I, I like crossing um, realms like that because oftentimes there's interesting thoughts that come up. Carlo? I think for vaccines, it's not so much of a biological mechanism that's driving it to be much more prevalent, but kind of, a, a, a population fatigue of just kind of like, it's not super important. So I'm not gonna comply is really more of the driving factors or the vaccine hesitancy might be something. Gary, do you wanna add anything? Well, I just, I think you hit on a very interesting, important point because at the societal level, we've half dosed. When, when, when fewer people are wearing masks uh, and, and doing all the COVID prudent behaviors, then effectively we're taking half the antibiotic dose and we're getting the effect from the pandemic, not at the individual level, but at a societal level that then the pandemic increases the same way as if we were taking an ineffective dose of an antibiotic at the individual level. I'm just, I wanted to add to, to kind of add to that metaphor is that, I mean, the, the antibiotic that we're producing is our, our humoral physical responses and our, in our cardiovascular symptoms, that would be finishing that analogy. So we're taking half a response. We're only giving our humoral system so much of a pressure collectively as a population because this is a community illness and we have to treat it as such. Otherwise, bacterial infections are really kind of for you and yourself with not as high the transmits factor as well. So if you are going to start treating this as a, as a collective humoral response, you have to treat it as a collective humoral response consistently without hiatus. So um, I guess I got a, a question asking Gary, if you wouldn't mind sharing that uh, visual on the stages of vaccines again, and maybe talking about it for a minute, because that looked quite interesting and it only flashed up for a few seconds. Okay. Oh, uh, there were two. One was the stages with the phase one up to phase four. Uh, that one, or was it the one, the different platforms? The one that I flashed more briefly was the platform one. Um, we could do both, I think. I'd be interested, and I think okay. everyone else might I see um, the request be for curious. The platforms. So let me get that one up. Um, give me a second here. Let's try this. Okay. And um, so here, this is the. Uh, most likely, I think this will be the one that will probably, barring any unexpected unforeseen developments, probably reach licensing first, uh, Moderna. Would that be a rough guess? Okay. I'd say it's actually going to be a viral vector one. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, that would be the But option. it's going to be close between the two. There's, Unless you go to the Chinese one, in which case it could be the inactivated one. Ah, so whichever okay. one Pfizer's going to put their money to is what's going to happen. Pfizer, uh, Pfizer is doing an uh, mRNA, I believe, aren't they? I think Pfizer's over here with that's, Moderna. That's one of them, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a couple people doing the subunit, the, the, uh, a, an analog spike protein that's here. Um, 
and then uh, viral vector, which is the uh, United Kingdom, Oxford, AstraZeneca. And then we've got over here is the Moderna. And I, I believe those are the three in the US, the Moderna, Pfizer, and the AstraZeneca that are sort of the leading contenders, at least for government money right now. Um, so so the, uh, this would be a segment of RNA, or, or Jeremy, did, are you, maybe you're most comfortable narrating the chart. Yeah, sure. I mean, basically, the, there are a couple different approaches to making a vaccine. Basically, what you want is you want an immune response to, you know, at least a part of the virus. So you can do that in a couple different ways. First of all, you can have the actual virus, and in the middle column, you have inactivated. Um, the one, yeah, there you go, inactivated. And so this is the simplest thing. You just take the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and you kill it and then you give it to people. And it's just like getting infected with the virus, except it doesn't actually infect you. So you can generate an immune response to all the parts of the virus, but you're never actually infected. So that's the simplest thing. And then you get a variety of ways of making that more complicated. So you can take the one just to the left of it, and this is the live attenuated virus. This is where you keep the virus the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but you mutate it in such a way that it doesn't cause disease and it doesn't replicate as well as it normally did. So it's much safer to actually give to people because it's not really going to cause disease, but the virus can infect, it can replicate a little bit in people. And so sometimes these live attenuated vaccines can actually generate very strong immune responses. So these two vaccines are what we have for flu. We have the inactivated vaccine, which is what most people get, and we have the live attenuated vaccine that children get because it helps them get, get a stronger immune response. But you can also take just parts of the virus and work from that. So if you go all the way to the left and you see DNA or RNA vaccine, so this is where you actually take a little bit of the genome of the virus, the genome that makes the spike protein, for instance, and you give it to people in a way that your own cells end up making the spike protein. And then you generate an immune response to that spike protein. Now, this is an attractive one because you get both cellular and humoral immunity. So humoral immunity is antibody. And antibodies, basically anything foreign that goes into your body, you start making antibodies to, for the most part. But to get cellular immunity, this is what we're calling T cell immunity. This needs some proteins to be within your cell. So if you just have something circulating through your body, you don't tend to get that cellular immunity. But if you have DNA or RNA that your own cells are making the spike protein to, then you can generate that T cell based immunity also. Now, this is in contrast to that subunit vaccine, the one over to the right, this is where instead of your own cells making that spike protein, we're just giving you the spike protein. So we're purifying it, the spike protein, or just a part of the spike protein, and then we're giving it to you, and you're making an immune response to that part of the spike protein. But that isn't getting in your cells. So you're not as effective at generating that cellular immunity, that T cell response. And finally, the last variant is this viral vector. And this is sort of an unusual way. It's very similar to actually giving the DNA or RNA vaccine of the spike protein, but it's using a virus to get it into your cells. So in this case, we still have that genetic material for the spike protein, but we put it in a virus that's safe, a virus that doesn't cause any disease. So in the case of the coronavirus vaccines, these are adenoviruses. There are a lot of adenoviruses. They tend to be very safe. They replicate very well. And so this is just another way of giving yourself that gene, and then you make that protein. So that's the sort of whirlwind overview of the different types of vaccines. We have several licensed live attenuated, inactivated, and subunit vaccines. We have some recent really good success at um, this viral vector vaccines. 
And we have a lot of DNA and RNA vaccines, but most of them are still in trials or development, although we do have a DNA vaccine that I think is licensed for horses now. So some of these are still in development, but that's the whirlwind tour. Thank you, Jeremy. That was awesome. Uh, and here we've got uh, the other visual. So somebody explain this perhaps, like uh, the different phases. So yeah. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Oh, no, go ahead, Carla. I mean, I'm making an assumption that the reason why it's narrowing to a smaller population showcases the risk of products failing until you get to, or how many products actually make it to that stage. Is that why it's increasing number and decreasing on the right side? Or is that another reason? How many are actually at that stage right now? Uh, yeah, this is as of August 4th. And um, so I, I, you're just looking at the funnel of uh, a staged, uh, a staged rollouts as people are catching up with their technology. Thank you. I was unclear, but yeah, that makes a bit more sense now, knowing this is a representation of products on the market as well. But I think we already ran through the the difference between the phase one through the phase three, which is kind of the, the goal of clinical trials before I get to the FDA approval. Um, but it's kind of that phase three, that phase four product, you know, actually testing it as you introduce it in a live fashion in the real world to populations that you still want to be able to monitor the risk and pharmacovigilance of adverse events for those products. And that's kind of where you find more realistic representations because between phase one to phase three, you have a wealth of inclusion criteria, what allows somebody to enter to a trial. We also have a wealth of exclusionary criteria, meaning that we don't feel confident letting somebody with this phenotype into the trial itself. And that phase four is super important as we start rolling this out at scale to larger groups that we have to start monitoring those that we didn't even have included into our trials. And this is sometimes just by design to showcase better statistics and better enrollment and better adherence to the trial regime. But I mean, we've sometimes as industry tested ovarian cancer drugs only on men before, you know, producing in women. So it's kind of one of those things that you have to be very cognizant of, of how you define these these parameters for these trials and make sure that you still plan for success when you do put it into the people that it's meant for. I think that's a hugely important point. And I just want to chime in with two very quick points here. First of all, is that in that chart, that was not the numbers for COVID vaccines because there is not a COVID vaccine in phase four trials. So that's just an important point to note there. Um, but secondly, I, I wanted to emphasize this sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria because clinical trials, both of vaccines and therapeutics, are historically not very diverse. And we are seeing a pandemic now that is having very disproportional impacts, and we are seeing dramatic health disparities here. And so there is a real crucial importance to make sure that we have inclusion in our clinical trials that is truly representative. So I, I think their intent was to represent COVID trials. And I was curious too about that stage four. There must be something internationally going on that they were including. That's my best guess. I'm gonna put a link to the World Health uh, up to date as of 31 July table of platforms and where they're at in terms of uh, trials. I'll throw that in the chat. I'm just thinking it could be that one repurposed vaccine that was going for a phase four that wasn't intended for COVID might be what it is. That could be, that could be. Clerical error. <laughs> okay, so um, this has been an awesome talk. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to feel the question um, before we start to wind down? I guess I'll, I'll give people a minute to think about that. Um, to our panelists, do you guys 
each of you have a final thought or something you would like to cover before we, uh, you know, take it home, go, eat dinner, and go to bed? Go vote for November 2020 election. Certainly. Uh, we all collectively need to stay, step up, think about um, politics and how to get politics out of the way of solving problems so we can solve problems because the amount of bog down is um, pretty terrible. And so, yeah, um, go out and vote is definitely good advice. Um, uh, Gary. Well, I, I'm more focused on the get the politics out of the way. And yes, that, that's as I said. Yeah, get the vote, get the politics out of the way, stop the roadblocks, get action going, all right. that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm on the same page with you. And I think, Carlo, we're, we're all on the same page on that. Um, but go ahead, Gary. So my focus is more limited to the virus. And yeah. Some can say that that exists in a broader context. I'll leave that to folks who think they can understand those broader contexts. Um, but uh, but as far as the virus, yes, I, I think that uh, clearly the vaccines, there's a lot of reason to be hopeful, but not reason to be hopeful tomorrow. Uh, th these are, they're not going to be here real soon. And while we're waiting for them, there's a lot of things we can do that have nothing to do with the vaccines and we need to be doing and we can't be operating in denial or pretending the pandemic isn't here. And we really can't let COVID fatigue affect us because however tired we may be hearing about the pandemic or however tired we may be in dealing with it, uh, the little virus doesn't seem to exhibit much fatigue on its own. It seems quite capable of continuing to infect us. I wanna thank everybody for listening. I'm muting, thanks. I think yeah, what I just, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say some kind of nonsense comment that doesn't matter. Go ahead, Jeremy. I was just going to say that I, I think it's just important to remember that the vaccine and vaccines are just one tool in our toolkit. This is not the only thing. This is not the end all or the be all of the response we have extraordinarily effective ways of combating this virus that we can use now, that we have been using, that we need to continue to use, and they're incredibly effective. But this is just one virus, and this is just one point in time. We're gonna have other viruses, we're gonna have other vaccines, and we're gonna have other efforts. And we need to be thinking, not just now, but how is this going to impact health systems, lives, health disparity, vaccination campaigns in the US, globally, and into the future. So we need to be thinking broad, we need to be thinking big, and we need to be preparing and moving to a brighter future and using this time to prepare, to message, and to be in a better situation coming out of this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been six months of COVID in the U.S. now, um, and it's been six months of COVID internationally as, I think, headline news um, started in November, so it's a few more months than that since the um, uh, precipitation of the outbreak, and it will be probably at least again as many months uh, before we see um, a deployment of a vaccine? Is that a good estimate for like the first time that we'll hear vaccines going out to people in the headlines? Is that like a good estimate? I think just the missing piece is in the near future, a higher rate of point of care diagnostics and hopefully more streamlined access to screenings and diagnostics for COVID-19 to help track um, spread as, as something that we might wanna start thinking about utilizing as those tool sets to help control and assess our, our, our benefits for vaccine or prevention risk. I'll make a guess of not this fall, but next fall for widespread availability of a vaccine. Okay, so something like 18 months um, before the mopping the brow kind of 
uh, moment, which is not even going to be the end of the disease. It's just going to be the finish line in sight kind of moment. Um, and the finish, like the true finish line may even be another few years after that. Um, but at least the, you know, we're, we're through the worst of it kind of take might be is still going to be 18 months out from Gary's guess. And again, this is all we do not know because we cannot know because these things are um, like, we know that there are many uh, vaccines going into trials, but we don't know what we don't know about those vaccines yet. And they may turn out to be ineffective and they may turn out to be too harmful to deploy at scale. Um, and they may turn out to uh, cause other problems and all of this. So we, we cannot know um, fully that, but uh, Jeremy, you have a yeah, comment on that? I, I would just add to, you know, one quick comment here, which is that the vaccine, just like so many of the other precautions that we've talked about, every little bit can help. No, it might not be till, you know, next fall until we have widespread rollout. But if we have limited rollout earlier, if we have rollout to healthcare workers, if we have rollout to high risk populations, we can start to see a real benefit iteratively and each little bit can make an impact. So yeah, we might be talking next fall for, you know, the bulk of the population to really see it be available but that doesn't mean we're not gonna see benefits before that. That's actually something we've made some headway in understanding to look for network hubs, to look for points of leverage to, to administer the early available of vaccines. Uh, Gary, um, before we jump off, I just had a really interesting question with, in my head, which may not actually have an interesting answer, but I wanna ask is, is there an in intersection between uh, vaccines and contact tracing that um, would be interesting to talk about for a moment, given that you are the uh, guy in the contact tracing space? Well, <laughs> thank you. And uh, I'm sure everyone's prepared for another two hours now. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. Because we're not going to have sudden, perfect, uniform, widespread distribution of the vaccine. We, we need to get the infectious people along with what Carlos was talking about, Carlo was talking about, about being able to do some surveillance to know who's infectious with our testing and get those results rapidly. We need to get them out away from the susceptible population. And that needs contact tracing. And the manual contact tracing systems right now are not working well. Uh, really, my personal opinion is uh, a digital backbone with human in the loop, uh, have humans do what they're good at, asking open-ended questions, interviewing people about uh, what they need to effectively isolate, but let the digital platforms do the calculations of who's come in contact with who. Trying to reconstruct that from people's memories right after somebody has a positive test result, very difficult. It's not really working very well in places where it's being used. And it's mandatory. We, we've, we've got to get the infectious people out of the uh, susceptible population and do it effectively and precisely. And that requires contact tracing. And then you can start to stand that down as you get more of your population vaccinated, if you can achieve effective immunity and, uh, and then just monitor uh, to be sure that you don't have uh, Resurgence, resurgence. Uh, thanks. Uh, not to make this carry on any longer than necessary, but I, I, I thought that was a really good um, perspective there about contact tracing is that we can ramp it down as we can bring the vaccine in, which means we have a manageable goal for scaling back contact tracing as a development, which is one of the really big privacy concerns. Uh, with contact tracing is that it stays long after the pandemic. But if we have a phase in the pandemic timeline where phasing out contact tracing makes sense, but the overall disease situation is still unfolding, that gives us a really good deadline um, for managing that um, de-deployment. Yes. And, and 
since you brought that up, I'll, there are digital contact tracing platforms that do somewhat prefer, preserve privacy. And there is some irony when people are complaining about the privacy, for example, on Facebook. If people really realize the extent of their digital exhaust and how much privacy we give up for the ability to stay connected with our friends and things like that compared to what we uh, may lose from poorly implemented contact tracing solutions. Uh, the contact tracing is really not where our privacy is going away uh, from what I can tell. Yeah, the, nice. like the, the zero-based project that um, you're associated with is a uh, anonymous um, contact tracing solution. And there are other anonymous contact tracing solutions um, as well. Um, so that like there's, there's a lot of potential um, solution making there that we're just ignoring because we're not having an adult conversation about it. Um, on the note of like Facebook and your dig digital exhaust, I once played a video game where one of the things that you watched was when people went online and based on that and a few other things that were sort of just, you know, their, from their interaction on the game, we one time figured out an individual person, their identity basically based off of when they went online it because they lived in a kind of rural area you could narrow it down and it, it was rather wild um the amount of information you can extract from really simple information if you just do the um the uh watson and uh um who's the sherlock holmesian uh approach to the data uh, i think it's time to thank all of you guys for um your time and to give what left what is left of the night back to all of us. So um, thank you, Carlo, Gary, and Jeremy for your time and knowledge on vaccines. This is amazing talk. Really glad to be here. This is knowledge packed, technical, thought provoking, um, and really quite great. So thank you all. Thanks to the audience for sticking with us and for asking some really excellent questions. We appreciate it. And we will see you again um, on the next ECV Experts Talk. And finally, thanks to Anjum for running all the technical stuff. I really appreciate it. And we all really appreciate it. This wouldn't be happening um, without your hard work in the background. So thank you. All right, everybody. Good night.